my favorite thing about working in healthcare is the people. This industry brings together brilliant, highly motivated individuals who are driven by the opportunity to make a difference. My name is Hallie Teko, and this is The Heart of Healthcare, a podcast where I'll be introducing you to the people on the ground, moving the needle in public health and medicine. Nursing has ranked as the most trusted profession for the last 20 years, according to Gallup. We know the critical role nurses play in our healthcare system. They are the true backbone of patient care. A 2018 meta-analysis found that the higher the level of nurse staffing in a hospital, the fewer patient deaths. But if you haven't heard, we are facing a nursing crisis. A recent study showed that more than 70% of healthcare workers in the country have symptoms of anxiety and depression. 38% have symptoms of PTSD, and 15% have had thoughts of suicide or self-harm. The pandemic exacerbated the looming nursing shortage across the country, and a recent McKinsey survey found that more than 30% of nurses are currently thinking of leaving direct patient care. Not only will this be an even bigger strain on the nurses who stay, but it also puts patients' lives at risk. So what can be done to reverse this trend? To answer that question, today I am talking to one of the authors of that report, Gretchen Berlin. Gretchen is a senior partner at McKinsey. A registered nurse by background, she leads projects with leading public and private healthcare organizations to develop innovative healthcare strategies and drive sustainable change through frontline workforce and clinical transformations. Gretchen, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start by discussing the supply demand imbalance and why it's led to this nursing shortage that we hear about across the country. It's a really important question, and especially given the timing, I would just say happy Nurses Week to everyone out there listening. We actually believe while there's a slight supply-demand imbalance at the moment, that it could potentially get worse if we all across various stakeholder groups in society don't change things. The sort of nursing shortage has been talked about for decades, really, and has meant different things. You know, prior to the pandemic, There has always been some variation across the country in terms of relative nursing supply, relative patient demand. But in general, our healthcare system functioned pretty much in equilibrium. There's always been use of overtime and contract nurses to be able to meet the variable patient demand. But in general, we had enough nurses in clinical settings to to get by. We've seen a couple of trends really pick up. One is the aging and retirement eligible population within the nursing workforce. And some of those folks through the pandemic deciding to downshift or exit their career entirely. And nursing certainly hasn't been exempt to that trend, if anything, has seen it a bit more. We also know that the amount of opportunities available to nurses has really proliferated outside of the clinical setting. And even within clinical settings, the site of care has also, the site of care options has also really expanded. And so as a nurse, you can be in an administrative role, you could work for a a health plan, you could work in a pharmacy clinic, and these things have just grown over time. And so the, the amount of actual nurses that we need across the board has grown. All of that said, I think where we see the shortage the most and where it is most acutely felt is really at the bedside and at uh, the, the inpatient need. And while there's been projections, I think even BLS has always suggested about a, a 10% increase of jobs between 2020 and, and 2030, that the need really at the acute bedside has become quite critical. And that is where we have really started to see the greatest strain and, and we expect could be quite significant going forward. So has bedside nursing always been a burnout profession? I think bedside nursing has always been a high stakes, stressful profession. Of course, 
in the US, if you are being admitted into an inpatient setting, it's quite serious. And what we've seen over time is patients have increased in complexity and the number of chronic conditions that they may have. Frankly, the physical requirements of a nurse have increased as patients have gotten more obese across the country. And as technology has come in to healthcare, it has both aided in certain areas and made nurses' lives easier. It has helped with patient identification and safety, but it has also increased documentation and other requirements on nurses, which has increased stress. And we have always seen turnover at pretty consistent levels, about 15%. It's ebbed and flowed. And of course, it's varied regionally. We've seen that increase through the pandemic, though, to uh, about 20%. Wow. And our research has shown that up to another 30% may leave in the next six months, which when we surveyed last year for Nurses Week, that was about 20%. It increased to 30% in the fall, but has held steady. And so uh, to my comments earlier that we, we may not have seen where this turnover and potential shortage could net out. That's scary. So you you mentioned the obesity. I hadn't really thought about that, but nursing isn't just an emotional job. It's not just a knowledge job, but it's it's also a physical job. Absolutely. For the most part, obviously there's variation in this, but in the inpatient setting, you're typically working 12-hour shifts, potentially longer, on your feet, running around the hospital. Regardless of the number of patients you're seeing, you're helping with transport, you're getting supplies from the closet, you're potentially moving equipment, but uh, even moving patients can be uh, extremely challenging. And obviously, companies have come up with solutions. Health systems have put in support mechanisms, even patient lifts to to help try to relieve this. But as you, as any individual ages, that becomes harder and harder. And I think that is part of the challenge with a retirement eligible (laughs) nursing workforce, literally being able to do it. And a lot of health systems actually have uh, innovated in how they tap into those more tenured nurses and use their knowledge to help train new grads, folks with less experience, whether that's sort of through central education or through virtual access to them without having to support all of the physical demands day to day. So we're hearing a lot about this travel nursing problem where temporary contract nurses are coming in, making double or triple what their staff counterparts are earning. Those employees are seeing that and maybe being inspired to become travel nurses themselves. Tell us about this vicious cycle. It's an interesting question because I, I think it's quite divisive, actually. On one hand, it's, it's really not fair to call it vicious Contract nurses, overtime nurses, per diem nurses have always been an important part of the healthcare system's ability to have flexible labor management and not have too much fixed cost into the system. And for the individuals as nurses, you really can't blame them for getting paid more. It's always commanded higher rates for the travel and the flexibility and frankly, the lack of consistency and assignment potentially that they're taking on as the need has really increased for them as full-time staff have either had COVID exposures or been out for other reasons throughout the pandemic, contract labor has been more and more important. And as in any free market, the price that they were able to command had increased. Now, unless you believe that the, the prices that they're asking for are out of balance or extortion or something, then there's one view of it. That's just the the free market in action. The reality is it is extremely expensive. And the other reality is for nurses who are full-time on the ground, working side by side, to your point, often having to onboard and orient the colleagues who are there only part of the time, it does become exasperating. And we used to see that, frankly, before COVID, that it was a dissatisfier for staff if contract labor was too much of a regular occurrence in on a unit where the inequity between what folks were being paid for doing the same job just really graded on people. Yeah. And ultimately, the total cost of it becomes quite expensive for a health system. And that cost has to be passed on at some point. I think this is an aspect of the pandemic that we haven't really 
seen the full extent of yet in terms of the just overall cost of delivering care yeah. fundamentally has gone up and what that will do for premiums and you know work its way through the whole healthcare uh, ecosystem I think could be quite interesting because at the end of the day it has to be paid somewhere. What do you think about some of the pricing caps for nurse staffing agencies that have been proposed? I mean, I would just echo what what I just said, yeah, I guess. Like, I mean, let, if, let if the if free market reign. Potentially, yeah. right? I mean, it, it can't be outrageous, but if that's at the end of the day, increased cost of healthcare delivery is not necessarily good for anyone. Yeah. But if we as a country can't figure out how to get a stable workforce in place, yeah. we will need contract labor. And I think a policy decision on are we going to put a price cap to that? But if we do, we may also see a, a ceiling for which people are willing to do it. And then ha- we'll have the same issues with access to, to patient demand. So on one hand, I completely understand the impetus for it. On the other hand, I'm not sure we do it in other industries or if it would really solve our problem. Yeah. So nursing has for a very long time been a female majority yeah. industry and profession. How do you think that has shaped some of the dynamics of being a nurse and how the role they play within the broader healthcare system? There's a, a whole host of gender dynamics that we could say maybe <laughs> makes them very caring and things in, in the fundamental sense. But during COVID, it has been doubly challenging. And we publish every year a report called Women in the Workplace in partnership with the Lean In Foundation. And we cut it for healthcare, but we see it in healthcare and across industries that this year, the pressures that women face in the workplace were significantly higher than men and significantly higher than previous years based on the stress that they felt to manage everything at home as well. And so when you Mm. take a workforce like nursing that is predominantly female, that adds uh, an undercurrent of strain and complexity. And throughout the pandemic to date, a lot of health systems have really supported their workforces with on-site childcare or other mechanisms to provide support for home so that they could be present as much as possible and as was needed in the clinical setting. Yeah. But the emotional and kind of mental tax that that all has is certainly felt and is common to what we have seen across industries, but even more so in clinical settings and not just nurses, but really anyone who's been at the front line putting their life, their family's lives at risk by going into work. It's just a different level of anxiety and pressure that is quite high. Yeah. Unimaginable. So how do hospitals charge patients for nursing services? We talked about kind of the cost of this care, but is it something where it's like a, a daily fee? Is it baked into room and board? What is, what's the general billing look like? The way that nursing care gets included in cost varies a bit by care setting, but for the most part, it is wrapped into the overall fee of accessing care. So only typically physician or provider fees get broken out separately from a workforce perspective. And then nursing and everything else is bundled in with just sort of the the daily charge of being in a hospital, for example, and, and not itemized like some supplies. And so what gets passed on in terms of cost has been held relatively consistent, Hmm. even though the cost base has gone up. And of course there has been funding centrally through the most acute parts of the pandemic to help health systems with the increased costs that wasn't just on the workforce side, but PPE, et cetera, that won't be in perpetuity, but the increased cost of workforce across the board likely will be. And so that's an imbalance that has to come out of the system somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, it's not just nurses. I mean, obviously nurses are extremely important, but the rest of the care team is also express, experiencing similar turnover and shortages. Everything from ultrasound techs to pharmacy techs, a lot of lab techs that mm. is causing challenges up and down the care continuum. So recently, a nurse 
was criminally prosecuted for an accidental drug mix-up where Mm -hmm. the patient died and she was found guilty of gross neglect and negligent homicide. I think this shocked a lot of us to see this in the news. How has this impacted nurses? I, I agree with you. I think that this situation has caused some ripple effects throughout healthcare. And what we have seen is some uh, impact, at least anecdotally, in a couple of places. One is just on the potential interest in getting into healthcare and the sense that, of course, you get into healthcare to help and, and do no harm. But a lot of what we're hearing is there's a sense that you would be supported in doing that. And if there's a sense that's not the case, then perhaps it changes the equation on how you're thinking about your profession. Yeah. The other thing is just on the cultures of safety and willingness to report near misses, mm. which is really important in highly reliable organizations, which we all hope our healthcare organizations are as we do our airlines and, and other very safety oriented things, nuclear power plants, et cetera those all rely on a culture of being able to share near misses or accidents that happen. And to the extent that clinicians are now more hesitant to do so, that could have real quality implications. And I think the third thing is we've heard nurses may be more reluctant to take on greater patient loads than they are even today that they don't feel comfortable with. So in today's environment, you, you know, have an obligation to comment or report that you're uncomfortable with a cur- certain situation uh, that you may be walking into from a staffing perspective. But we may now see nurses flat out refuse to do it because it, if it puts them in a position of potentially increasing their likelihood for error or the consequences of that uh, are increasingly yeah. criminal, it just... <sighs> could be quite uh, yeah. impactful. I don't know that we know, but those are sort of the ways that anecdotally we're hearing uh, an expected impact. We'll be right back after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. Is there anything built into the system where, especially during this pandemic, where Gosh, like there's, you know, obviously we 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 hope that everyone is doing their best and we expect everyone to do their best. But as they are taking on impossible workloads, mistakes are more likely to be made. And you think that people need to be protected from this system. So what are we doing anything to ensure that we don't lose more nurses because of this? Yeah. And I think this is where your, your comment that it's a, a systems problem is totally accurate. And it's a problem that everyone can play a role in fixing. As I said, health systems, this is not new and they have been working and are continuing to work to improve support for nurses, whether that support is in staffing and not just nurse staffing, but the whole care team, as I mentioned, as well as the culture and support and asking nurses how their day, their shift could be easier, whether that's better supplies, better technology, additional education, et cetera. Health systems Mm -hmm. have been looking at at all of that for years, but it has increased in focus during the pandemic. The other thing is that we haven't talked about really yet is making sure that nurses have opportunities to recharge Mm -hmm. 
Mm. There hasn't been a lot of time for respite throughout the pandemic. And I think that is another attraction, frankly, to some of the contract nursing that we talked about earlier. You can do it for a period of time and then take a period of time off that even if you're not going to contract labor, there's an increasing shift from nurses being full-time going into part-time or per diem where they have greater flexibility to do that. And a lot of health systems are working on how to embed that more in their full-time staffing models. So do you have a certain number of shifts in direct patient care and then a certain number of shifts in more education where you can take a bit of a step away from at least the direct coal face of the direct yeah. bedside. Not to imply that, you know, education is not as challenging, but it's just a bit of a different dynamic. Yeah. And options like that, we will probably see more and more of to help the overall resiliency of the care teams. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of us in a lot of industries just need to think about how we can better balance our mental health at work and to be as productive as as we can be while taking care of ourselves. Absolutely. And it's yeah. it's not just the workplace and in the employers in this instance. You know, it's not just the health systems that can play a role. We talked about educational institutions and, frankly, some of the federal, state, local support that yeah. goes into loan forgiveness and grants and incentives for folks to go into certain professions, but also to support creation of academic and clinical spots to ensure that we can do that training. The society at large, in terms of support for the profession, yeah. and it's interesting when we've talked about this before, we've gotten some feedback <laughs> that you know nurses don't want to parade, they don't want to be clapped for they they want you know in this instance they want you to wear your mask get your vaccine um stay out of hospital yeah yeah. but at the same time how do we support healthcare in general and nursing in particular as a really revered profession um, where they yeah are supported there was a local facebook group and a healthcare worker I I think a nurse, uh, she posted that she was looking for temporary nanny work where she could bring her newborn while she was on unpaid maternity leave. She works for a very large hospital system with over 10,000 employees and needed to find work during her her unpaid mat leave. I mean, I was, it it blew my mind that this was uh, something, I mean, being in tech in Silicon Valley, there's quite generous relatively quite generous maternity leave, but it feels like we need something universal for all parents. Probably, I mean, this is a whole other episode that we can get into, but to think about, you know, a nurse on mat leave not being able to take her mat leave and looking for work during mat leave is, I mean, she got the time, but not the money. So very disappointing to see that. As a country, I think we have a a bit of a ways to go on supporting a parental leave in general. But I think that's one example, but also just supporting our healthcare workers' families who, you know, this has also been a stressful time for them, wondering every every time their loved one went into a care setting, if they were, what they were going to be exposed to and and what to come home with. And that's been exacerbated in COVID, but it's not Mm. that different than what it is on a daily basis. And in other first responder roles, whether it's firefighters or military, we as a society have kind of set up an ecosystem of support around them, nonprofits, you know, for their family members, for them and others. And perhaps there's more that could be done for clinicians. Yeah. So are you optimistic that the nursing shortage can be corrected? And what is it going to take? I am optimistic. If I wasn't, I feel like uh, we all would have curled up into a cave and given up by now. I, you don't I know really, that I'm not in a cave right now. <laughs> that's true. You might not have Wi-Fi, though. Yes. <laughs> um, I think that there's a ton of energy around this. And while there's many things about COVID that have divided the country, there isn't much to be divided about when it comes to supporting our healthcare workforce, whether it's your family going through COVID or your family going through childbirth, cardiac surgery, cancer screening, everyone is going to be impacted by this. And it doesn't matter where you're from, what political belief you're, you affiliate with. This is 
a universal issue. And I think that kind of solidarity is quite empowering. And while it's somewhat daunting to say it's a systems problem and we need education and policymakers and society and everyone to get on board, the exciting part of that is everyone can do something. And we are at a critical time in all of our industries, but healthcare is is no uh, exception in terms of how technology and analytics can help. And I think there's massive opportunity to figure out exactly where the type of care is needed, what staff is best met there, and then supporting them through technological advances to allow more virtual care, to keep patients out of in-person care as much as possible. And obviously a ton of activity is happening on that front, but we could be on the precipice of something really amazing uh, if we all harness this moment. I hope so. I mean, they say you have to hit rock bottom and I, it feels like rock bottom. Um, yeah. Well, we hope we've hit rock bottom. Um, yeah. I think that the potentially scary thing about what our analysis has showed is if we continue to see increased patient demand from some of the trends we talked about earlier with aging population, increasing complexity, as well as some of the net new demand we will experience because of COVID the, uh, on a couple of fronts. One, just an ongoing low-level demand of COVID patients as long as uh, the disease remains endemic, let alone another surge. Pent-up demand that hasn't been seen throughout the pandemic and the impact of delayed care there, as well as demand from long COVID symptoms that research is starting to show around diabetes and cardiovascular implications as well. And so that growing demand coupled with the workforce trends that we're seeing of increased turnover and potentially acceleration in that we could potentially have a gap, we estimate, of a quarter to half a million nurses over the next few years, which I've seen estimates even larger than that, depending on what you believe about care models and acceleration of retirement. But that could be, you know, 10 to 20 percent of the nurses that we need. So I appreciate your comments about rock bottom, but I... I, We might not be there. We might not be there yet. That's scary to think about. So you do an annual survey. You also have a really great report called Nurses and the Great Attrition. How can listeners learn more and access the great assets that you've put out there on this topic? There, Yeah, there's a couple of things that we're publishing this week as well with Nurses Week. One is more details on the analysis I was mentioning in terms of the shortage. The other is a global comparison to some of our comments earlier, while there is are some opportunities to get nurses from international markets, the reality is the strain that we're feeling in the U.S. is common across the world and in particular many of the developed countries. And I guess in some, in some way that gives us solace we're not alone, but mm-hmm. it shows that the challenge is quite global. And there's more on this. There's more on uh, the implications of women in the workplace and healthcare and otherwise. All of our research is available on McKinsey.com and you can go into the industry section for healthcare systems and services. A lot of this has been written about by others too and other industry associations. So I, if nothing else, would encourage folks to continue to get educated on the topic. If you happen to be in a healthcare setting, thank those around you for what they're doing, thank their families uh, and ask what you can do to help. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, Gretchen. No, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you shedding light on the topic and uh, hope you have a great day. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Heart of Healthcare. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social and tell all your friends to listen. The Heart of Healthcare is a product of Offscript Health. We are a healthcare engagement company built for patients and caregivers by patients and caregivers. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our senior producer is Brianna Seely. Our intern is Antonella Sterniolo. Our host is Hallie Tecco. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Brianna Seely. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscriptnot.com. That's media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscript.com. Dot com.